we should be empowering the user to be a participant in the conversation so they can add value to the NFTs they're holding. Their, their NFTs can become more valuable and not just in a way of like being like devs do something, but literally there's pipelines there and bridges that exist that they can add value to the narrative and content creation process. Welcome to Layer Zero. Layer Zero is a podcast of unscripted conversations with the people that make up the Ethereum community. Crypto is built by code, but it's composed by people, and each individual member of the crypto community has their own story to tell. Cypherpunks understood that the code they write impacts the people that use it, and Layer Zero focuses on the people behind the code, because Ethereum is people all the way down, and it always has been. Today on Layer Zero, we're talking with Marguerite de Corcel, which you might actually know as Coin Artist. Coin Artist has been around in the crypto space for a very long time, before there has even been as much room as there is today for the intersection of art, games, and crypto. Uh, uh, Coin Artist is definitely an artist type, hence the artist in the name, uh, and she's focused on Crypto gaming, but not in the way that you probably are hearing crypto gaming with where, what you think of it today with games like Axie Infinity where you have NFTs and they do stuff. Uh, Mar Marguerite is focused on uh, a much more cyber cyberpunk version of crypto games as in like, how do we... Uh, how do we have interactions of the NFTs in our wallets? How does like if a uh, two NFTs of the same game end up in the same wallet, an interaction happens? Something a little bit closer to Conway's game for life, or just something about embedding data in the blockchain rather than just having like a normal game that has crypto assets embedded in it. Um, so you'll you'll hear us unpack what that means, uh, and it's this very untapped world of gaming that has not yet been built out that I hope does eventually become built because it sounds really, really fun. And, and Marguerite slash coin artist is one of the people building out this world over at Blockade Games. Then uh, we also talk about um, the physical center of the metaverse, which is New York City and what's going on with New York and what it means to be social in the world of crypto in this day and age. Uh, so all these conversations and more are coming your way right after we get to some of these fantastic sponsors that make the show possible. The Brave browser is the user first browser for the Web3 internet with over 50 million monthly active users. Control your digital footprint with built-in privacy and ad blocking. Inside the Brave browser, you'll find the Brave Wallet, the first secure crypto wallet built natively inside of a Web3 crypto browser. Web3 is freedom from big tech and Wall Street, more control and better privacy. But there's a weak point in Web3, your crypto wallet. The Brave Wallet is different. Brave Wallet is built natively inside the Brave browser, no extension required, which gives the Brave Wallet an extra level of security versus other wallets. With the Brave Wallet, you can buy, store, send, and swap your crypto assets, and you can even manage your NFTs and connect to other wallets and DeFi apps, all from the security of the best privacy browser on the market. Whether you're new to crypto or a seasoned pro, it's time to switch to the Brave wallet. Download Brave at brave.com slash bankless and click the wallet icon to get started. When you shop for plane tickets, you probably use Kayak, Expedia, or Google to compare ticket prices. So why would you limit yourself to just one exchange when you trade crypto? When you make your trades, you want to make sure you're getting the best possible price on your trade. And that's why you should be using Matcha. Matcha has smart order routing that splits your trade across all the various liquidity sources in Ethereum. And is also operational on Polygon, Avalanche, Binance Smart Chain, and other chains. Trading on Matcha is super easy because it pools the liquidity for me in a single easy to use platform and allows me to make limit on-chain orders so you can set and forget your DeFi trades and they will go through automatically while you're away. So when you're making a trade, head over to matcha.xyz slash bankless and connect your wallet to start getting the best prices and most liquidity when you trade your crypto assets. Bankless is proud to be sponsored by Uniswap. Uniswap is a new paradigm in asset exchange infrastructure. Instead of a cumbersome order book system where trades are matched with other humans, Uniswap is an autonomous piece of software on Ethereum that lets you trade any token at the current market price. No human counterparties or centralized intermediaries, just autonomous code on Ethereum. Input the token you want to sell and receive the token you want to buy. The Uniswap Grants program is accepting applications for grants. Do you have something of value that you think you want to contribute to the Uniswap ecosystem? No matter how big or small your idea is, you can apply for a uni grant at uniswapgrants.org and help steer Uniswap in the direction that you think it should go. Thank you, Uniswap, for sponsoring Bankless. What's up, Marguerite? How's it going? Hi, David. How are you? Oh, this is fantastic. I think a lot of people will actually know you as your other name, Coin Artist. 
I think that's kind of where I want to start this uh, start this uh, this talk is where did coin artists come from? So coin artist actually it came in 2014 um, when I was just discovering Bitcoin, and I discovered that there was this place called Crypto Twitter, which was yet to be you know called Crypto Twitter, but it was all where these industry thought leaders were expressing um, their opinions about Bitcoin. And it was the first thing I thought of because I was an artist, as a fine artist. And I was like, okay, I'm making a Twitter handle. What is it going to be? And I was like, well, coin artist. It's really generic and not a cool story at all. <laughs> but, um, but at the time, actually, also, my, I was known as YT instead of Marguerite or mm -hmm. coin artist. Um, and YT came from, if you've read Snow Crash, it was like this superhero, mm -hmm. like how could I make this um, character persona? And so I was, I was that person anonymously basically until about like 2016, like people didn't even know as a, as a woman, um, m making crypto puzzles and playing around with creative technology, uh, the intersection of crypto, art, games, uh, start really early on. Before you discovered Bitcoin, what, I want to unpack the art side. What, uh, what kind of artist were you? Were you like a, a painter or, or digital art or what's that? Yeah, I was a, uh, I was a traditional uh, painter and, uh, and did drawing. And for me, I did, so there was a lot of magazines at that time that needed art, cover art. Um, like even just, like I remember doing a picture of Andreas Antonopoulos for Bitcoin Magazine um, for one of their articles. And it was in that process of making those uh, portraits that I started playing around with different concepts. So one of the projects with Amir Takai and Cody Wilson, they were working on something called Dark Wallet at the time. And Dark Wallet was all about obfuscating the Bitcoin transactions, like act acting as a little bit of a mixer as a wallet. Um, so I was like, hmm, I wonder if I could hide something in this, you know, to like play into that obfuscation. And uh, that's when I realized that a Bitcoin like private key with the, the numbers and characters could be turned into all kinds of pattern making to equate to, uh, to that information, you know, how you can take binary and binary can then equate to ASCII. Um, so, so then like, how could you make these different patterns into the art and like basically hide things in plain sight, um, embedded into the artwork. So that's when I had that like little aha moment and I shared it on Bitcoin talk org the um, Satoshi Nakamoto's forum, and people just loved it. It just became like this big viral thing. And as an artist, I was like, "What did I do?" <laughs> so like I, I kept um, so I, I teamed up with people along the way, and and we continued to make these pieces. Um, and it only became more gamified and more complex over the years. But uh, that's how it started. So when people talk about the let's combine art and crypto. If you, if you tell them those words, they're going to think like, oh, yeah, you're talking about like NFTs and Web3 in 2021 or 2022. But you uh, were an artist that got inspiration from crypto back in 2014 before Ethereum even existed, like before we even had smart contracts. And there's like one level of crypto art where there's crypto and then you can illustrate things about it. But you you jumped right into a, a, a deeper connection be behind like the ethos and values of crypto and being an artist with like the integration of uh, like, you know, private keys in actual art. Can, can you talk about just like what you saw in the early days of being coin artist as the potential intersection behind crypto and art? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'd say initially the creative started looking at blockchain like a new, uh, a new medium um, and how can we interact with it? And there were some fascinating things like you can, so it's this decentralized ledger, but you could store all kinds of information on, on it. And so when it was cheaper, people hid images, they hid ASCII images, they hid all kinds of information. And how can you interact with the blockchain in a creative artistic way? Um, there was a lot of people, you know, it's, I can't totally recall at the moment, but there were a lot of fun experimental projects. And Rhea Myers is someone who I worked with uh, early on, and they were a part of that exploratory group um, now is the head architect at Dapper. Uh, but so anyways, there was just a lot of like, like what can, and, and I think we all loved the idea that the technology was so new. So people had to like, and the hide, hiding in plain sight thing and just the Satoshi Nakamoto, like his, his lore. So it was really inspiring for us to think about how could the blockchain be this new medium? And like Bitcoin itself was maybe as as a transfer of value was a little less interesting as far as like the unit, but it was more like 
things you could embed on the blockchain that was that was pretty cool um and and like using hashes uh as and and pointing like we did things like make fake addresses um to make like trails digital trails that led to information that if you put it all together you got something uh so it was just kind of this neat process because of the fact that there's no third parties involved and it all just exists out there so understanding decentralized and distributed networks um it was really a fun playful time and i think that's actually a big missing piece right now like for example um a lot of the creatives and artists just skip that step they are now with these the interface and um and making like minting an image that they feel like is an NFT, but you're missing the whole like deeper meaning and how that ties into the networks that could be way more creative or like artistically driven um, as an entire process. I, I think I think you have some people making those steps, but you know it's interesting. You, you saw this uh, back with different cryptos that people didn't really care about that like how interesting the technology was. They really just cared about the user experience. So it's interesting to think about to these artists that are making extra efforts to make, um, like for example, Josie Bellini today just launched uh, Cyber Brokers and it's all on chain using SVGs and um, my CTO at Blockade Games is a part of that, like he helped with that launch. But just this deeper conversation about these assets being on chain and what, and what this art project is, I don't know, I just feel like there's a huge gap in education now. Um, and I wonder how we're gonna recapture that if, or if we do recapture that. I. I I actually don't know. Everything's so financially driven. Um, and that's maybe the bubble that everyone feels. But I don't know if it com the conversation comes back to the the interesting innovation of the technology behind everything, you know? Like, it's it seems like people are just more excited about making money in new ways. Yeah, I, I think with what you kind of just described where you, you kind of laid out this Easter egg, like, MMORPG, like, art hunt using by embedding data straight into Bitcoin, where you had like fake addresses that meant something and it lead you down a trail that felt very gamified. That felt like uh, the intersection of like art and games, but using data inside of a blockchain to be the board on which this game is played. Whereas, whereas like now in the NFT Web3 world, it's really just like very external to the blockchain. It's like, yeah, we just use Ethereum to mint our NFTs, but everything else is external. Um, it definitely has to do with like the rising transaction fees and we can't really play with data on the blockchain in the way that we that we once did but uh is my is my intuition right that you were really interested in kind of making this like this shared ledger that we all have that can host data and turning it into like some sort of like artistic game rather than just like you know sending bitcoins around like how how important was the gamification of it yeah absolutely i mean i think all of the projects that we participated in since 2014 had some sort of magical moment where we're playing around with blockchain technology to kind of demonstrate something that otherwise wasn't possible um something that we did in 2019 was called um oh, i forget the actual title of it but it was a humans versus zombies headless game mm -hmm. in which we sent nfts we airdropped nfts and half were human NFTs and half were zombie NFTs. And then there was this um, score, scoreboard website. All it said was how many humans there were and how many zombies there were. If you sent a zombie to a wallet that had a human in it, then you didn't like transfer your zombie. What happened was you minted a new zombie asset into the human's wallet. Um, and it then turned their human into a zombie. And so then on the scoreboard, the zombies are, you know, gaining a zombie. Um, and you could use an antidote. And then the human gets frozen? What? The human uh, NFT gets frozen or something? Well, the NFTs are non-transferable. So, oh. yeah, so they're oh, in your okay. wallet. And then it's like basically a virus. And, and, right. Um, it's an on-chain so virus. On virus. Yeah, and it doesn't use a central application. Um, and so anyways, we just launched this at a hackathon. I think it was like, um, am I, maybe Harvard, a Harvard hackathon? I can't totally remember. But um just this idea that with smart contracts, you can make this entire game just using smart contracts. Uh, didn't You don't need to have an actual game like uh, application. And that was really interesting because there's so much more of that that could be done. But do people care about that? Like, do they care about that game experience? It seems like everything is monetarily driven. Um, mm -hmm. So how do we actually how do we actually inspire people to play in ways that just like with traditional games, like how many people just sit down and play games because they're awesome and fun and interesting. Um, they're social. 
how do we bridge that gap with where we are today um, with this financial motivation, which is really turning off a lot of gamers, like actual gamers. They think this whole space is going to be a complete scam or is a scam. And then you can see it already that the games that are trying to launch are already angling at that um those pre-sale items to have the highest prices as possible to price right. people out and then build this toxic community. And then you're going to be turning off all the gamers. And then will you ever launch a game? I don't know, but that it feels very ICO in that way. It's just like ICOs, mm -hmm. but with extra better marketing because we brought in all these 3d professional, you know, artists now from the game industry because these NFTs are selling. Um, so how, how long is it going to take for us to actually, or will we ever get over the, this, probably bad reputation we're about to spin up just in the same way that ICOs, like ICOs never came back. Um, right. They rebranded, they came up with all kinds of different, you know, acronyms to basically be the same thing as ICO. Uh, but they, they really did that stigma stuck. And I think that games and NFTs are at the same risk right now. I totally went on a complete tangent there, but <laughs> like, anyways. No, no, it makes a ton of sense. I, I think what I'm hearing is like, there's this, uh, domain these this category of crypto games, which are very very foreign to like the tradition the tradition tradition <laughs> traditional like the typical crypto games that we see today, like the the wolf sheep game or like uh, Axie Infinity, which are very just like the, the driven by the value of the assets. But uh, I think what what you're alluding to is like there's this category of like on chain games that are crypto that are uh, where the playing field is Ethereum or L2s or just w whatever's in the blockchain rather than just like, you know, NFT assets and, and something like that. How, like how, how big do you think the world of just like on chain, how, how, what do we even call this, this category of game that if, if we're not calling it crypto games, because that's been co-opted by this whole like NFT number go up toxic value movement. Like what, what do we call the, the versions of games that are like on chain, like the virus type games that you just explained. Is there, a, have you thought about a name for this? No, I mean, but that I was using NFTs, right? And I think at the time we were all saying blockchain games, you know, and if we weren't using NFTs, no one thought NFTs was going to stick as far as an acronym. Right. So it was really interesting that it did because everyone was thinking, this is terrible. We shouldn't use NFTs. We should say something else. So we all, we're all trying. We're like blockchain games, crypto games, like trying to explore other terminology. But NFTs is what's the, um, and maybe the mystery because people didn't know what it was. Um, and I, I don't know if you're going to be able to differentiate uh, assets, that, decentralized assets and the different models. Um, because, well, if you think about gaming, you have all kinds of different types of games like, you know, you have an RPG, you have a, uh, you have a roguelike, you have a, there's just like different ways to label games. I don't know if crypto is going to really be able to get more f finite than, than, um, mm. than just, mm. and if, I don't even know. What do you think about when you hear games like crypto games? Do you, the first thing you think of an NFT game or do you think of crypto? Yeah. Well, so like to, uh, the virus example is actually something that I have, like uh, pondered about or daydreamt about is like what happens when we can have like assets like like can can you have like this virus asset that just like naturally people like accidentally run into like damn it I caught the zombie <laughs> virus now my now my wallet is a zombie wallet like it doesn't meaningfully impact my wallet like I can still do all my things but now it's got the zombie token in it like damn it now it's now I got caught by the virus and like there's stuff like I I just have always wondered about like is there this world where just like there's this th these assets in our wallets that have meaning inside of a particular context, kind of like kind of like uh, you know it, the game, as in the game that everyone just lost because I brought up the game. <laughs> Sorry, like stuff like that <laughs> on Ethereum. I feel like does th how big of an arena is that? Because like there's a few examples that I can think of, but I'm also not the most creative person. But like, and, and I take your point. Is it like how how like how niche is that? Like if everyone, everyone needs to be good at like using block explorers, everyone needs to be able to write their own transactions. Uh, like it's, this isn't up to the wallets. This is up to like ether scan and stuff like that. And so it's a lot harder of an audience, but it's actually what feels like the new thing as we're actually using this technology in ways that we could not have used, um, uh, this technology in, in different ways. Like the, you know, you can play Axie Infinity without having assets, right? In, in theory. But like with the zombie virus wallet game, like that is brand new. That is something that like 
And I, I think that something that's similar in this category is uh, the Dark Forest, uh, that, that ZK roll-up game. I don't know if you've played mm-hmm. that. Um, uh, so maybe this is one of those things where it's kind of a concept now, but maybe maybe we need ZK roll-up technology to make these transactions super cheap and, and instant. I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on that? So there's like different types of games on different networks that are people are playing with and interacting with. But uh, yeah, I think it, the cost of playing. So for example, like in with, so I work with, with uh, so I'm with Walkade Games, and our one of our missions was to make a free to play game. So how do you put everything on the back end so the players just having this experience interacting with decentralized assets um, that could become valuable over time based on their gameplay? And how do you build for that? And it's true, like even on Polygon. So we and we launched on Polygon. It's becoming more expensive now. Is it is it scalable and going to be sustainable for us to continue that way? And so it's going to be on our roadmap to explore what are alternatives and what is the cheapest way for us to. Ki- keep that free to play experience but um yeah i guess like the different types of games so there's all kinds of things i think like remixing of content for memes for example let's say you make a meme and it's like it's some it's got composable layers and it's in your wallet i could see someone sending another like meme to you and it affecting and changing your meat. Like we can remix mm. media and content based on our interactions across wallets. And I just think of this as like being a fun thing to do and for nefarious purposes as like trying to, you know, if you want to bomb your friends with something, like <laughs> I just, I want that to exist and I want to know how I can. And I love the idea of sending a bomb to a friend, almost like, um, like you're trying to sink a ship. And they have assets in their wallet. What, what, what does this mean? What, can you unpack that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, so let's say you have that NFTs that businesses. are susceptible to some sort of a bomb that I send, and okay. I could blow them up if I send it. Maybe it just costs me. Okay. Maybe there's some sort of mechanic there that makes me really consider about sending this bomb. Like maybe you have something in your wallet that if I do this, it's actually going to blow back at me. Mm. You know? And, oh, it's a trap. <laughs> and I don't know. And like I mean, maybe there's, like, there's just ways to think about that um, and these different crossovers of NFTs and, and projects that could exist. Um, and yeah, and, and like just mess- playing around with your friends in ways like that where it's not a big deal but there's almost an element of permadeath, but it's also just kind of funny. And then there's some sort of retribution that can exist and reward systems that could exist and badge systems that could exist um, all on chain. And I think like, I think there's a lot of room to play there and everyone's so focused on trying to make, like, if you think about it, everyone's like the next big triple A game and it's going to have the coolest art and these assets are going to sell for so much money. But really the fun is like very much more accessible than that. It's just how do you inspire people to want to play? Um, because it, even even if you think about it, these blockchain games, no one's actually like playing them for fun. There's a grind component of can I earn and like manipulate and exploit the system and make some crypto and then go sell it. But no one's actually playing crypto games for fun at the moment. And what is a differentiator between a crypto game versus just a traditional game? And as a game company or as a creative, why would you do one or the other? If you're just trying to do something for fun, why wouldn't you just do a traditional game? So if you're going to use blockchain mechanics or game mechanics that are new and exciting, how are you going to leverage them to actually inspire people to want to interact in that way? And will they want to interact with an app, go outside of OpenSea, you know, spend time on a third-party website, um, we haven't seen that yet. And I don't, I'm, I don't know if interactive NFTs are going to be the answer where you can play the games directly from the OpenSea website. Um, so you can play things like, like a Minesweep. There's things that exist right now using iframe support in, on, directly in OpenSea is like playing Minesweeper. You could have, my, anyone could play with this particular NFT that's owned by one person. And then it's, you can be signing the winner and having a leaderboard that of everyone that's interacted with it and like with the leaderboard of this particular interactive NFTs like output, if that makes make, makes sense. And you can do all kinds of like from that basis, you can do dungeon crawlers. I could host a raid. I could put assets up for a bounty without people ever leaving OpenSea, for example. Um, if you think about most casual crypto NFT collectors, they probably do not leave the OpenSea website very often. Right, right. Because that's not where number go up is, right? That's that's kind of the trap of where we are right now. Right. So, uh, with your 
I want, I want to go back to the, the bomb NFT. So th- I think that's really cool. And, and just to, just for listeners who are fearful about their like board ape or their <laughs> crypto punk getting exploded, this wouldn't work like that. All the assets that would interact with like this bomb thing would only be part of the same ecosystem. So it would be an opt in thing. It's not like your NFTs are going to go explode, but like the, the idea is that like you could have an inventory like you do in a game and you have assets in there. And I don't know, maybe this game is about, um, how many of your how many assets can you destroy by sending a bomb but like you could also in theory have like an anti bomb shield and you could not host that in your wallet but you could make a zk proof that you have one and then if you get bombed you can uh like show your zk proof that you actually have a bomb shield and all of these things are like technically possible with with cryptography and the the cool thing about ethereum or blockchains in general is that you know these things are inherently turned based because they go one block at a time. So every single block is one like unit of time in this like blockchain game because there is no middle time between blocks. And so like the, the substrate on which we play on these this these blockchains are so conducive to like this turn-based strategy game uh, and and no one's really been able to like fully tap into that power yet. Totally. Like, I think, like, making factions and alignments and playing around with decentralized identity and, like, exactly what you're talking about is is so fascinating because people will be like, what what just happened? And I also love the idea, like you said, your board ape would be safe, but you could allow mm-hmm. people to opt in into, like, wrapping their board ape or, like, you know, sure. making it so, like, they could submit assets with the fact that the higher value the asset and some sort of scoring generating system mm-hmm. would allow them to have more weight when they hit you know, versus, um, and, and then also reward system and payback if they, if they're successful and, and defend their, their base. I think when you think of your wallet, it's really fun to think about it. Like you could build a tower defense and like defend your base. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and then also like, how are you sending resources to help other people hire like teammates and how can like you create this ecosystem, which I think is actually like a part of the future here. It's just, I don't know yet how it makes money and that's the mm. like so how can you sustainably make money because even just a crypto payout reward it's not really tied to any anything va- valuable right like but I would like to say this is a big difference why gaming and NFTs took off on Ethereum versus Bitcoin is because of that capability to bootstrap so uh because Bitcoins are limited you know, uh, developers have to walk into the space and have their own Bitcoin. And then they're holding on to the fact that Bitcoin's going to keep going up, but they had to buy into it. Whereas in the Ethereum space, you can start your project, you can come up with your own tokens, NFTs, uh, your own like ERC20 token. And you have this whole economy, you can just bootstrap and launch and with value generation and then um, then ride on your reputation and, and your, like, if you can deliver. So that is such an advantage. So like it is potential that you could have these kinds of ecosystems in the Ethereum or similar networks. Um, It's kind of sad to see Bitcoin not actually take off in that same way, but it's also maybe okay that Bitcoin's one purpose is to be sound money. And I think a lot of Bitcoin enthusiasts have a hard time with that. I think early on when Vitalik was interested in colored coins and counterparty, um, I was really listening in that, in that time period, because it was creative use cases that I wanted to see happen on Bitcoin. But there were so many challenges because of the fact that a lot of decisions would affect the end goal of, does this make Bitcoin sound money? And if it doesn't answer that question, then they generally said no. Um, and, and so even with Lightning Network, there's potential here to get creative on top of Bitcoin. But the rate of adoption on Ethereum and other places where you can bootstrap faster and you have more users that don't need to be tech, as technically inclined has a faster rate of adoption. But the downside is that nobody is as technically inclined. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and it also like there was like a natural schism, right? Like all the, all the sound money people got, I guess for better or for worse, got pushed out of Bitcoin. I guess some people saw that as a disappointment where, um, like we could, we, um, do you feel like particular alignment with Bitcoin, like to this day, cause I, this crypto world is very, very tribal. And when people get into the space, the timing of when they get into the space kind of impacts, um, how they perceive the space. Right. So like people that got in in 2013 generally are Bitcoiners more than they are Ethereans. And 
fewer people make that uh, the the pass over to Ethereum later and later in time. Like, do you wish that Bitcoin was a, a good substrate uh, for um, like gaming type activities? There's a few. There are a few Bitcoin gaming projects. Um, gosh, I can't remember it off the top of my head, but like, uh, I I just don't know if. But I think most of the Bitcoin gaming efforts are like playing traditional games with like a Bitcoin kickback, almost like a right, like a Satoshi every now and then. Yeah, now. you know how like Lolly rewards work, where you have that Web three mm-hmm. plugin, and based on your like purchases, you're get, earning Bitcoin as a reward. Um, it seems like they're mostly like that where you can get this reward of Bitcoin um, based on gameplay, which is pretty, pretty interesting. I think that's, that's interesting still, um, but it's not as interesting in my opinion, like creatively as what we can do with, you know, just the different combinations of smart contracts and interacting with people and um, the mayhem that could pursue across decentralized networks. But it's, you, uh, you said the word permadeath, yeah, uh, and I want to I want to go into that. Can you talk about the role of uh, what permadeath is, and talk about the role it plays in gaming? Well, permadeath can actually mean a few different things, but um, in this particular case, I mean, uh, well, are you familiar with like Eve Online? Uh, I know the game. I have not played it. So in Eve Online, I asked Hilmer, who is the CEO of. Um, uh, of C, what is it? C, C, G, C, P, C, G, no, I can't remember the acronym <laughs> of, the, of Eve Online. Um, and he, I was asking him about how he was going to fix botting. So they have a real economy. And um, what happened was they decided to flag players that look like they could be bots and allow everyone to come and harvest. So they get flagged. And everyone nearby gets a notification and can go over to them and, and like acclaim all of their assets. It doesn't blacklist the player. It just allows their assets up for grabs by the larger community mm. who can get there first, which is a really interesting thing because you can't like necessarily defeat, defeat bots, right? But how do you make them a part of the core part of gameplay? I also, so in, in that case, like permadeath is not necessarily your account dying, but you've lost all of your assets. You've experienced, you know, a huge loss in NFT space. I think it would be so exciting. I don't know if you've ever played dark souls where you, I, it's my only gaming series that I swear. By. <laughs> so yeah. you die and it, and you totally die and you have to start over at the very beginning of the game, um, which is really infuriating for a lot of people. And some people hate it so much to throw their controller, but at the same time, they, they love it. <laughs> like they, so like that for me sounds so exciting because um, I can imagine. So even in, in our current game that we're thinking of uh, that the design that we are building, thinking about horizontal opportunities for people that want to play at a D wrist um, mm. in more of a D wrist fashion, and then a vertical where you know you horizontal dungeon crawlers, and then imagine you have a vertical like dungeon crawler where the higher you up you go in social class, the higher risks you take, the more you're putting up mm. to lose, and if you lose, you like you drop you socially like basically kicked out of society to a certain extent it could go all the way down to like the street mm-hmm. level but the time that you put into the game is deleted yeah well to some capacity you have to figure out like mm-hmm. what would people be willing to do and also what assets would they want to put in escrow to mm-hmm. to lose is it characters is it gear is it you know like what parts of this is going to be acceptable for people to experience. And honestly, I feel like since people are so emotionally attached to their NFTs that like putting, like losing them would be very, like for me, I'm thinking about this for me. Like I would love that. I would love the risk of losing my assets and and gambling in, in that sort of capacity, but like with a skill-based gambling. So like playing Magic the Gathering. Imagine you're playing a Magic the Gathering tournament and you're playing with your deck and then everything you're playing with is going to be up for grabs by the person that wins the game. Um, that would be pretty cool. Like, because then you can even have this ledger of, let's say someone is just crushing everyone. They're going to have this history of all these NFTs and who they took them from. And that's like, that's such a flex. <laughs> that doesn't really exist today, mm-hmm. right? I, I think um, 
the, the, one of the reasons why uh, a lot of people just hate Call of Duty is because as soon as you die, you just respawn and then you just go and do it again. So you have people like throwing themselves in Call of Duty into just the middle of just a firefight in ways that we, I mean, it's a video game, obviously, but just there's no death penalty. Because like if you die, you just go do it again. Uh, but then there's there's versions of Call of Duty where there is a death penalty where like you actually die and you have to just sit for 15 <laughs> seconds. And people's behavior in the game changes because of the penalty of having to wait 15 seconds. Like people are just like approach the game a lot more carefully. Time out. Like they, they <laughs> really don't want to die. They're, yeah, like they don't want to be in timeout. That's a great way to put it. Uh, and so like that's like but that's just 15 seconds that's just asking you like here your your penalty is you waste 15 seconds of your life before you wait to respawn and like the i think uh, an amount of just like emotional engagement and emotional captivation that comes when like if i die here i lose my nfts which are like a part of my wealth that starts to like mimic a lot of like real life Right, like people never roll, run into Call of Duty in the way that they would actually run into a war zone because that's just not the right behaviors. But then, but then, like, if we so start talking about like metaverse games, like blockchain games, if you actually have something to lose, which is why people love and also hate Dark Souls at the same time. Like, if you have something to lose while you go and play, it and there's real value at risk, and you actually are putting the time and energy and like blood, sweat, and tears on the table while you play these games, human behaviors around these games are likely going to change. Yeah. Well, and I also think it makes it really exciting to think about how you could. <clears throat> so, there's something else I'm thinking about is. So, for example, the game we've been building is Neon District. It's a 2D game. What if, though, as you go up in society and you're having these tournaments and this permadeath experience, you have the opportunity to start collecting 3D assets for the future game, like a future expansion mm. of the game. And like, and it's like you're creating sinks of the current assets, the 2D old school game. But imagine this progression instead of having like, <clears throat> you know, the first version of Final Fantasy 1, 2, 3. What if it was more of a like linear where they're all connected and fluid and you're like progressing out of one game and earning your way into the second um, and to different types of the experience and different types of the game modes based on your achievements within the certain like construct from the start. And everyone has to go through that funnel. Um, or you buy into that funnel. But I think that's where you could really protect the integrity of the free-to-play game with people that put in the work to grind at the beginning. But then also, if you want to buy into the cooler versions, you can, but you have to, you're have you buying from people that played through them. Uh, so I don't know. Like, There's a lot of interesting ways you can think of game progression and the fact that these NFTs can have multiple file types associated with them. And the game... like. <clears throat> Game developers have the ability to, to update, if, if they design it this way, update all the metadata and the different files in, in different ways to create those additional experiences. So it really is a whole new, like, that's where I get interested. And I feel like those are the places where we win gamers is like, because they've never had that. Imagine, imagine playing all of your Dark Souls franchise games in a way where your past work mattered for future experiences. For you, especially when we think about decentralized identities and how important those are going to become, um, I think that's where you win loyalty uh, with that hardcore fan base. Yeah, you, you've, we've definitely seen a lot of like NFT and, and crypto gamer hate coming out of like the gaming industry, the gaming community, and just the, all the NFT anti NFT community. Uh, is kind of what you are what you're saying with the, the ethos of which you're building at Blockade Games. Is that like something that you're hopeful? can like win over the hearts and minds of these people that currently mostly hate our industry? I think like, I don't want to say that we're going to single handedly prove to all gamers <laughs> in the game industry that um, there's value here. What I would like to do is seed the ideas and the creative ideas that uh, with other developers, that there's other opportunities that resonate and that people will enjoy. For example, when I did um, my Twitter account, right? I hit 50,000 followers. And I worked with this company called LinkDrop to whitelist all of my followers up to 50,000 followers. And if they were whitelisted, then they were, had the ability to claim for free their first NFT ever. And the response to that was huge. It was like a 90% conversion rate of, every, like of, of everyone that clicked it. They, it was a brand new wallet, essentially. Um, so like, if you think about that, how many people are lurking out there and waiting for invitations and wanting to like participate, if you make something friendly and inclusive, people want to participate. So 
um, it's more about seed. And, and, and I've had a lot of people talk to me afterwards that that was a really powerful moment for them. It was either their first NFT or they realized that, you, you know, you didn't have to participate. Like, and it just meant a lot because it was this. So in this, in this case, it was this um, compilation of all of the followers. They were a part of a, um, an image that you know, that was like of me and like my history, but the, like I had all my users, uh, the followers on, on Twitter that were a part of it. You could zoom in and find yourself. And they were a part of the story. So I think like that's something that we have to realize and re like everybody is a part of the story and how can you appreciate them and honor them and not make it a cash grab? Because the minute you have that um, separation, you, you create a toxic environment. And so that's the, I think, the, anyways, that's the largest challenge I see right now. And I, and I do think that a seeding creative ideas, showing people that you can have inclusive activities, that it doesn't have to be high value to start, that you can have a gradual value creation process um, is going to be the way to have that, that loyalty, long tail revenue, um, and, and also ways to unlock our, our users to have ownership in the entire universes that are being built. That's something that I'm really passionate about is you have so many creative developers, artists, um, just how, how can they participate in this ecosystem? If you're waiting on the developers to ship content, ships in the storytelling and the users just to, to get to consume, there's no active participation back. There's no conversation back. Mm. Then that's like basically the same model that exists today with game companies, which is, the difference now with um, decentralized networks is that, and these open source communities that we've all, a lot of us have come from, is that you, we should be empowering the user to be a participant in the conversation so they can add value to the NFTs they're holding. Their, their NFTs can become more valuable and not just in a way of like being like devs do something, but literally there's pipelines there and bridges that exist that they can add value to the narrative and content creation process. Yeah, I definitely want to go into that because that's a, a big theme that I think we see across the board is that the whole concept of like tokens and communities, tokens can allow communities to have a voice in ways that they didn't prior. Like in the trad world, you would have the artist on stage with a one-way flow of artistic creation out to the consumers of that. But then it, when you instantiate a community inside of a token or NFT or some sort of community group or DAO or whatever, uh, the community gets a chance to reverberate what they see as value back to the artist. And it can become a, a two-way conversation. We're seeing this with um, People Pleasers' new uh, project, uh, Shibuya. I, th I, I don't know how to pronounce yeah, yeah. it. Um, that, that was it? No, okay, no, well, I mean, I don't know if that's uh, it. <laughs> yeah, I know so, what you're something talking like about. That. Well, yeah. <laughs> but, but like the community gets to dictate the next chapter in like a story of, a, of an animated series, right? Like it's actually up to the community to determine what happens next. Can you just like paint the picture of like the, you, the utopia that's created when we have a, a world of games and arts and communities that allows the communities to be a role in its, its creation? Well, so like even... Okay, so this is a actually huge vision that I have right now. Um, everything from in real life experiences, right? So think about um, Dungeons and Dragons and you have a game master hosting an event and everyone playing this board game and having this experience, right? Like I honestly feel like we're in a place where if you open up the opportunity to have something like a Star Wars franchise that everyone gets to participate in the core part of the storytelling, which has m potentially multiple different veins of that storytelling happening. That's like maybe, um, canon. It's like Star Wars canon in this case, but then you allow people that who are super fans to have guidelines and ways to participate and add on to their own, like they understand enough of the context. There's a big enough wiki. People can contribute to the wiki and building outside stories and side experiences. And then you have, the in real life experiences. So currently today, when everyone gets together for NFT events, it's like TVs on a wall and drinking and a DJ. And like, that's the best we can do for our in real life NFT experiences. But honestly, what we could take that is um, things like with a slight game, of, like you could have kits that include gamification, in real life NFT minting, how it fits into the overall like universe that everyone has kind of agreed upon and, and being able to host these parties. Like I think about even the joy that people had in the almost 
complete pyramid schemes of like makeup companies or other products where people get together and they just love getting together and hearing their friend talk about some sort of makeup and everyone buys it, you know, and they have these like, uh, it doesn't need to be totally a pyramid scheme like that, but we can do better than this complete disconnect that's happening right now. And I do think like the universe and the shared vision of this like place of lore is a, is a, a unifier. And I do think like some core game rules are unifiers. So even just like Conway, I was just showing a friend this yesterday, Conway's Game of Life is this simple rule set that's existed before computers even existed. And then it today is still proving out new permutations that are possible within this game, um, which is very simple. It's like this grid where there's these cells and cell is alive or dead. Um, and like people from this simple rule set came up with things like factories and spaceships and other permutations that are really interesting and excite the entire community. But I think like to peel it back from there with NFTs and art and storytelling, content creation, empowering people around the world to participate in a place where all they need to do is show up, have a little bit of skill and have fun that like we can we can access something that maybe we've never done before you know like imagine magic the gathering being a little bit more decentralized a little bit more accessible allowing their users to have a little bit more input you can have your tournament cards which are official tournament cards that you know like these are the ones that we will accept and then you can have the creative sets which magic has always done the different creative sets and seasonal um, renditions so anyways i think like that community participation and, and empowering the world through uh, these decentralized technologies is where we all win together because of the fact that we've never been able to onboard everyone in the world into an economy. And this is the first chance to do that and doing it through a creative lens and a lens that's easy to understand like game rules is the best way to get crypto into everybody's hands. And when you do that, then you have an entire empowered world that is not dependent anymore on the like the success or failure of a nation state, but rather as like a global, like humanity as, as far as like what we think is exciting, what do we want to collaborate towards in the future? So I think it's like this we're really early, but I think the vision is there and how we can bring up everybody together based on simple shared loves and talents. Well, the, the passion is clearly palpable, palpable. So I'm already a, a big fan of this, of this whole vision. Slingshot is a decentralized trading platform that combines the performance and ease of a centralized exchange with the openness and transparency of DeFi. Slingshot aggregates liquidity from all of DeFi in order to find the best price on thousands of crypto assets. Every token on Slingshot comes with a price chart and trade logs to give you insights into the market's activity in real time. Slingshot is available on Polygon, Arbitrum, and Optimism, saving you from the high gas fees and low transaction speeds of the Ethereum L1. There are no fees to trade on Slingshot and any positive slippage is given to the users. Trading on Slingshot Slingshot is a social experience. You can even set your chat avatar to your favorite NFT or soon a Slingshot 2099 NFT avatar. Once you bridge your assets to Polygon, Arbitrum, or Optimism, go to app.slingshot.finance to trade and use the chat box to share your trades with others and find other tokens to ape into. Arbitrum is an Ethereum scaling solution that's going to completely change how we use DeFi and NFTs. Over 250 projects have already deployed on Arbitrum, and Arbitrum's DeFi and NFT ecosystems are growing rapidly. Arbitrum increases Ethereum speed by orders of magnitude for a fraction of the cost of the average gas fee. When interacting with Arbitrum, you can get the performance of a centralized exchange while tapping into Ethereum's level of decentralization and security. If you're a developer who wants low gas fees and instant transactions for your users, visit developer.offchainlabs.com to get started building your application on Arbitrum. If you're a user, keep an eye out for your favorite DeFi apps or NFT projects building on Arbitrum. Many of your favorite apps are already live, with many more coming over soon. You can find these apps at portal.arbitrum.one, and you can bridge your assets over to Arbitrum using bridge.arbitrum.io in order to experience DeFi and NFTs the way it was always meant to be. Fast, cheap, and friction-free. The Gemini Exchange has been my exchange of choice ever since I got into crypto. I use Gemini to both buy the dips and also manage my regular automatic monthly purchases of my preferred crypto asset. On Gemini, you'll find over 50 different cryptos, including many of the top DeFi and metaverse tokens like YFI and Axie Infinity. Using Gemini Earn, you can earn yield on your various cryptos, including 8% on the GUSD stablecoin. Gemini is available in all 50 states and more than 50 countries worldwide. So if you're looking to upgrade your crypto exchange, sign up at Gemini with Gemini.com slash go bankless and get $15 of Bitcoin after you trade $100 or more within the first 30 days. That's Gemini.com slash go bankless.
One of the other themes that I think that, that you were touching on that I think is pretty core to crypto is um, uh, emergence and putting, pushing complexity towards the edges. Uh, Conway's game of, ga- of life is like one of my favorite metaphors to kind of explain DeFi. I used it in a relatively old article called um, Ethereum, the Money Game Landscape, uh, which was a, a, a eventually a prelude towards yield farming where we ha- I, all these like DeFi apps we're all competing to get points. And what are those points? They're Ether and they have these gig Conway. Anyways, I use Conway's Game of Life for that. Conway's Game of Life, like Ethereum, is a state machine, as in it progresses one state at a time. And, the, and what you were saying with like, uh, even though this game of the Conway Game of Life was before computers, but enabled by computers, much more expressive because of computers, you could do more things. But it's, it's such a simple rule set. There's only like six rules for Conway, like if this, then that statement is for Conway's game of life. And it creates like this immense infinite playing field for other people to play on it. And they get to create the structures that you listed off the factories, the spaceships, the gliders, the floaters or whatever. Um, and, and it's, and it wasn't the, the, what was created is not in the rules. It's a, it's a, it's a manifestation out of the rule set itself, kind of in the same way that Bitcoin is supposed to be maximally simple, yet you can manifest so much more on top of it. And Ethereum is supposed to be just a, a very simple, st- expressive state machine, but so much can be expressed on top of it. Uh, and so th- I think what, what you're you're leading into is there's this world of, of games out there that could, in theory, just have a very relatively simple s- rule set, but when you design it right, it creates a lot of emergence and allows people to create the stories rather than the stories being creating creating the stories. Is this all right? Yep, absolutely. And, and I think like the emergent quality there that you're touching on is the most exciting. That's the thing that sense of discovery and I'm actually contributing, like as a user that's participating in this rule set in the universe and I can, there's a discovery being made and I can contribute to that. I think that's one of the most exciting things that I could experience. Um, and I think that's why I also focus on that idea of a magic trick as us being using blockchain technology to show people and seed ideas and be like, look what you could do though. Like this isn't this interesting and inspire people. But when you do drive people to being like, oh wait, we can create these entire ecosystems that perform a certain way that maybe wasn't the underlying like like point, but it, it, it did come about. And how do people organize around them and and continue value creation around them is going to be so interesting. And I do think that's where we get it. Like things get exciting. It's just, we're stuck right now in the very early stages of just understanding. You have to understand that digital art wasn't transferable and wasn't even a viable, like, unless you were being like contracted, it wasn't a viable means of income really to be just be independently a digital artist. You needed to have some sort of job and, like even just being an artist, it was, it was always difficult. But so now that we've unlocked this store that digital art is transferable, that was really exciting. And I think people are are hung up on that, but the deeper meanings of where this could all go, it's just how how do we bridge that gap? And I think that's up to a lot of us that understand the magic points and these different connections like you're talking about, the emergent behavior, like ways to inspire people, inspire to play. Um it's just, I think, I think Dark Forest actually maybe is touching on that more than a lot of other projects, but that in that specific way, there needs to be more of that, more of that genuinely driven, like, I want to show people what's possible with blockchain. I want to show people what's, why is it more interesting and not it be about just monetary only and bottom line only. So with that, I think it's it's finally time to dive headfirst into what is going on behind the scenes at Blockade Games. Uh, so can you give us the pitch of what what Block Games Blockade Games is and what you guys are building? Yeah, so uh, Blockade Games was a is a game studio that we kicked off January 2019, 2018. Sorry, and um, it was it was actually um, the when crypto kitties happened we i had been waiting for a non fungible token type so a metadata token right something that could um capture a player's experience in a way that um translated to value and that didn't exist really until that moment, or at least it wasn't clear that it existed. There was things like colored coins and there was things like metadata coins, but they weren't, you could always uh, like wash them 
per se. They weren't like binding. They wasn't using the the smart contracts in a way that this was a whole journey progression that creates value over time. And so when that ha- when CryptoKitties happened, we were like, okay, we're going to launch the game company now. We're done with our side projects, our educational side projects. We're ready to go like build this RPG. We wanted to make a cyberpunk World of Warcraft RPG and use users' interactions and uh, their choices and specializations to create assets that became more valuable over time and wanted to be free to play. So we had a lot of wants and it was actually pretty difficult to figure out. Um, But anyways, yeah, so we did something called Plasma Bears, which um, a lot like Gary Vee is really excited about, a lot of people are pretty excited about except for the fact that we launched it on the Loom network, which was early layer two type. It was like layer 1.5 type network that died. And um, so what happened with those plasma bears is we made this complete free-to-play game. And then we built a bridge from Loom network to Ethereum. So everybody that had uh, plasma bears and transferred it over to Ethereum had their bear. But there were millions of bears made and crafted, and they're composable. They're like build a bears. Um, and we worked with people like X Copy, who's now very famous, like maybe one of the highest selling NFT artists today, which was just because I liked him back in 2018. I was like, oh, we should work together. And we made this game. So, anyways, of the 1,200 bears that were transfer- transferred over to Ethereum, now they're, you know, an X Copy bear sell. It can't, you can't buy one cheaper for 100 ETH. Um, but it was a completely free to play game, you know? Like that wasn't the purpose. So, so we took that tech stack and we innovated on it for Neon District, which is something we're still focusing on, which is that, so it's similar in that build a bear concept where you can compose and create a character. Um, and then you play with a party of characters and you take them instead of, in Plasma Bears, it was a text adventure, you know, as a means to not worry about the game mechanics or animations or any of that. But in Neon District, it's it's definitely more about that turn-based battle experience and then the outcome and then how you are accumulating what's called Neon, which is an in-game currency that is non-transferable that you use to funnel into your NFTs to progress them and turn them into um, higher level characters. So anyways, um, I guess at Blocky Games, it's still that vision. Everything I'm talking about in this whole conversation is how do we create this experience where people get really excited about what's possible with NFTs. And um, yeah, I guess it's just like, it's, it, it doesn't need to start at a high value. You can start with a zero value asset and it can evolve over time to become more valuable based on your choices, your input. So then it becomes a cl- conversation, it's collaborative. And then your decision makings, um, when you go up another player, you can build any deck essentially you want with your characters. And how do they perform against another party's, you know, uh, characters? So I don't, it's just like, it's a little bit different than what exists today. It's not as complicated and deep as what it could be with a AAA game, like, you know, a Dark Souls game, but it's still trying to prove that the user can have, be an intimate part of the conversation of the um, progression of their assets. And then where does the value come from? Yeah, I, I, it seems like you're trying to build an ecosystem, a game that, uh, uses that is very very true to the ethos of crypto, and also not trying to cut any corners. As in, we have this technology, we have this way of imparting meaning into this game, we have this way of allowing individuals to have control over their assets and and them be uh, the admin of their own story in the game, and that's very admirable. And not cutting corners in crypto is such a difficult thing to do because every time there's a mania whether it's the ICO mania or the NFT mania or now the crypto gaming mania, it's because people found a way to cut a corner and like skip to the end where like the assets are trading for $50,000 on OpenSea. Like that's like the end goal. Then some, and some people just realize that they can actually just skip right there via some sort of like scarcity, scarcity Ponzi game. And, but that's not what I'm seeing out of you. What I'm seeing out of you is, is a commitment to the bare bones of, of the, what this, what the technology has what, how this technology can enable a game. Has that, has it been like enticing? Have you felt, have you felt like the pull to like sell your soul and try and do some of these like NFT game shenanigans? Hold on. Let's not forget that I made a crypto puzzle back in 2014 where Mm. I seeded that wallet with five Bitcoin when Bitcoin was worth Mm. like $250 per Bitcoin. 
And then that particular puzzle wasn't solved until January 2017. Um, might have been 2018. I can't Whoa. totally remember. And so the puzzle was worth a thousand, a hundred thousand dollars at the time of being solved. And so the motivation there. This is the same puzzle that you talked about earlier. This is different. I made I made oh, a lot okay. of puzzles. This is one of them. And you made a lot of puzzles. I made All a right. lot of puzzles. And this is one of them that just took a longer time to be solved. And the motivation wasn't mm -hmm. like, oh, well, I should pull that money out because obviously it's cooler. No, it was really cool to put that money in at $250, like $250 and it to be $100,000 and to see people like get inspired to solve that. And then someone did win it. Um, like the motivation there is just to like do it. It's, 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 it's not like the mon and this is where the artists really come into play, right? Like the creatives and artists, they're not necessarily like, driven by money you have a lot of artists that exist in the world that just want to do cool shit because that is like what they want to do with their life it's not to have a ton of money um and that to me was like a powerful moment and I had a lot of people be like why didn't you take the money out and it's because it was like cooler that I didn't <laughs> like, so a and seeing story. it solved and someone pull like I like to describe it as a sword from the stone is so exciting and validating I did something and it became more valuable over time someone took that money and it was a, an experience for everyone I want that same feeling with the game and the game assets I want that same, like, I started with nothing, I'm walking through, I'm creating value, and like all of a sudden I have something epic and amazing and it's a part of this huge story and it will only get bigger. Like, and I'm a contributor to that. Like, that's, that's what I want because I want that to exist in the world. I don't feel like that exists. I don't feel like people have the opportunity to really go, like, in a way that's pleasurable or a way that feels meaningful. I don't feel like it exists and I want it to be more present. How often does uh, this this metaphor is just abused to death in the crypto world, but like Ready Player One, where we have all of these people in this world and the world actually matters, right? The 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 universe, the Oasis universe is like where people like live their lives and they they play their games and whatever. But then there's the meta game that like the Willy Wonka, I can't remember the name of the guy in, in Ready Player One, but like he's basically Willy Wonka. He leaves like the meta game behind. Where like if you can find all the Easter eggs and if you can unlock all the puzzles, you get the key, keys to the kingdom. Like how how much of this like uh, inspiration from or just like acknowledgement to like something like Ready Player One have you have you thought of? Oh, I read Ready Player One around the same time I read Snow Crash and some other sci-fi books like mm, Damon and Freedom yeah. uh, in 2014 when I was going being red pilled uh, into the crypto space. But honestly, if you were a gamer, it made so much sense that with Bitcoin, it was internet money. And if you understood internet money, you understood like, oh, okay, this transcends all these applications. It's going to be like a, tra a currency across the internet. So... I would say that those narratives, though, are inspiring in the in the way that you think about um, when you think about the metaverse. I mean, like Snow Crash coined the term metaverse mm -hmm. with Neil Stevenson, and, but like Diamond Age is another one that's really actually more of a hopeful story, um, and how education could could be. So I don't know. Like I guess like I, the digital treasure hunt Easter egg component of what could That's exist is definitely like something I would like. It's just the reality is most people and most people in the world, it's such a niche audience. I think mm. games that are more um, inclusive in a way where it's not just only a few are going to be good enough to get this one prize that exists out there. It's more like, your time and value and how you participate can equate to value based on just the fact that you're contributing is that is more of the narrative that is inspiring as opposed to this race to get something at the end that's going to be potentially life-changing. Um, I it, What happens is you just have too much of a fall off. So actually I was just talking to a friend the other day about Satoshi's treasure, which was this digital treasure hunt that happened and it had the massive prize but you just can't inspire people to move, travel around, go to great lengths at this like chance of success. I think the chance of success needs to be way more clear that the fact that I'm giving in some time, I'm definitely going to leave with something more valuable than what I put in because not everybody can afford to just have an educational experience. 
So like if we're going to have a blockchain game that actually like onboards a million players, it's it can't be something that requires like a $20,000 NFT to enter or off. And, and and you're also saying it can't like require uh it has to be it has to offer some sort of like prescribed path for people to engage with or some at least some very clear set of rules and it probably also has to be like free to play right uh because you can't you can't ticket entry um i'm assuming these are are these all like components of how you lead your yeah, your team over at Blockade? absolutely and also like whales want to get beaten like they don't want to be cool because they have money you know they like mm-hmm. having money is cool but they actually want the like guy that is really skilled to come up and challenge them. The people with all the wealth and power want to be dominated. Is that, is that what I just heard? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so like, and, and, um, and, and they want it to be fun. They want it to be like, okay, I had the money and look really cool, but I also, I can defend myself and I'm awesome because strategically I'm still amazing. It doesn't, it's not about the money. Mm-hmm. The money just made me look good. They want to have that narrative. And, um, and the, and the person that has nothing wants to have the narrative where they went and like challenged the person that did have all the money and they just like took it to them. So these are narratives that the, we want to exist. The, when you silo your whales and you're like, this is a whales game, to be honest, they're like super bored. Like no one cares. Like, I mean, so great. You've got a high valued PFP. Now what? Like that, that's what, that's what always happens is like, what do we, what do we do now? So you, now we're going right. to be a part of Bored Apes and we're going to have a Rolling Stones like article and then we're going to have this like concert and you have to ha- get in based on if you have a Bored Apes. But honestly, you can tell it's not this intermixing of personalities and, ex- and like the, the thrill right. of having the high valued assets. It's, that's not being leveraged right now. And sure, access is one thing and access is and community based access is one thing, but it's actually the thrill of being just a standalone individual that's talented or skilled for your own, your own individual reasons that allow you to be a participant in let's you plus your asset. It's not just the asset. Right. And, and that's where you get to leverage that sort of like passion. That's, that's really, really cool. What, what that made me just think of is like, we have, we have all these like blue chip NFTs, right? We've got uh, crypto punks and board apes. And I guess those are maybe the, there are probably some other blue chips up for interpretation, but then, then there's like the side of the NFT world that like rotates all the time. So like right now we're on to like Doodles and Azukis and like a few others. Uh, and like, I wonder if the game is like, because as soon as some NFT project gets like higher than like one ETH, it starts to price out like 90% of people. And so then as soon as it goes, gets too high, uh, the 90% of people have to move on to a different NFT because they got priced out. And then the whales probably try and figure out where all the small fish are going and then they buy the rares out of that pool and then it turns into another whale game and then the other people have to move on and so like i think w- uh, what i the the realization i just had is that like it's this trap this like this there's never any sort of like stable equilibrium because there's always people segregating because we haven't been able to generate a platform where the small fries and the big whales can actually exi- coexist at the same time in the same place Yep. No, totally. And you have your people that are spreadsheet kings masterminding their way Mm. into the ecosystem and participating and like trying to start from the ground up. Right. So like that's how do you do that process? Just make it more fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amazing. It's really, really cool. Uh, the, the other thing that, that came to mind is that I think it's actually really uh, interesting that we've been using Dark Souls as a metaphor here because like the lore of Dark Souls is that you are one of an infinite number of, um, depending on the game, the most recent one is uh, Ashen. You are Ashen. You're made of ash. And there's millions of you. And you guys are you guys, they're basically like zombies. And if you are the chosen one, it's like a chosen one type story. You will be the one to like rise up the ranks. You will grind through the levels. You'll get more powerful. Uh, you'll find a better sword and then you will kill the boss at the end. But like in the part of the lore is that there are millions and millions and millions of you and you are just a speck of dust inside of a sea of other, other ashen ones, other tarnished, other, other chosen ones, whatever. Uh, 
but like it's all about the story of like rising out of the ranks and being able to grind like being on a platform that is equal and and accessible by everyone and it's up to you to actually grind through the ranks and destroy the boss at the end of the game so I think it's funny that we've been using the Dark Souls metaphor to talk about this, and it kind of is like a similar thing. Yeah, no, no, totally. Like, I think that's it. Is it ever, it's the hero's mm-hmm. quest. Yeah. Ooh, the hero's quest. Love it. Love it. Um, uh, Marguerite, do you want to talk about any more game-related stuff? Because I also want to talk about New York at some point in time, but I don't want to close the book on, on, the, close the book on games too soon. No, I mean, there's, a, there's just a ton of ga- like, games... I, I just want us to be able to be proud of our space and, and what we're doing as game developers. And I want to see, for example, it would be so cool to see blockchain game developers at GDC giving retrospectives on like making a blockchain game and what went wrong and things they learned. What's, what's GDC? GDC is a game developers conference. There's It's coming oh, okay. up actually here uh, at the end of March. But the thing is like, you don't see that. You don't see that in our space. You don't see game developers being like, taking that sort of like the same level of honesty that a lot of indie game developers take there's that that game developer conference is so great because it's like salty crusty game developers that like have died really hard like you know big deaths of their game and this is what they learn and they're sharing the story with you and i would love for us to get beyond this marketing hype of trying to be like the best project out there and like sugarcoating everything to being like making games is hard and this is this is what we learned and like this is what we were trying to do this is actually what happened and like us to get to that place of comfort um where us as game developers in the crypto space could actually like learn and thrive and i don't i don't know if we're gonna get that i i don't know how long it's gonna be um but because of this immediate monetary injection that the games experience, it feels like people can't talk honestly. Do you think, um, yeah, do you think that we are just early and this is the golden age of blockchain games is ahead of us? Or do you, are, you, are you concerned that there's like a fundamental values misalignment that might not be overcomable? Yeah, I, um, I think it attracts, I think what we have is some, an area that attracts a lot of bad actors and I think it's going to ruin the integrity of a lot of the people that wanted to play with the technology. And it's going to be hard to differentiate the two. Um, and I don't know, I don't know how it's going to go. Like, I wish I could say, well, obviously we're going to go over it. And like blockchain is obvious and decentralized assets are the obvious answer. But I don't know if that's true. Like, I, I, I truly do not. And I've known a lot of things. And I had a lot of North Stars in my life. And I don't know that we're going to make it through this time period because it's going to be incredibly exploited. Well, I usually leave the uh, call to actions at the end. But if one, people want to come in and try out Neon District or any of the other games, I don't know if you guys have developed more games other than Neon District. But what's the right call to action for people to get a taste of what we've been talking about today? Well, so Neon District, the MVP that was launched in um, January twenty. 20- 21 is still live, but it's getting a massive update right now with the V2. And then we have the larger game that's coming out with it this year. So it's like, if you're interested in a free to play game and playing around with NFTs, definitely neondistrict.io. Um, and you can, you can see what that's like, but it's definitely a work in progress. Um, and it's, it's definitely not user friendly at the moment, but still people are motivated enough to like figure things out. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, so, so definitely check out Neon District.io, and there's going to be other free-to-play games that'll pop up, I'm sure. Um, it's got, so Skyweaver, I love that mm-hmm. development team. Um, Horizon Games is the people that have made Skyweaver. And similarly, very, they're very passionate about building these experiences with decentralized assets. It's not necessarily about this money grab. Um, so there are some different existing projects out there that are worth checking out, and and I think like also inspiring each other to build and create, you know, like you don't always just have to wait for the next airdrop. You can also get creative and playful um, in small teams. Well, we will definitely get a links to those games in the show notes. Um, Marguerite, I want to I want to talk about uh, New York because uh, about a couple months after I moved to San Diego, you text message, you messaged me and was like, you should move to New York after I think it was after like NFT NYC or something. And I was like. Marguerite, I just moved to San Diego. <laughs> it's too late. But then, then like six months later, I actually do end up moving to New York because of how all the crypto people are there. Can you give to the listeners just the pitch of 
the crypto pitch for New York? Like why, why might somebody be interested in New York? Yeah. So I thought about this before I had moved here, uh, last summer and it, this is before I fundraised for Blocky Games. Um, mm -hmm. I really thought about if we're going to build a metaverse for, for Web3, where is that going to happen? And I thought about Miami. I thought about LA. I thought about uh, London. And honestly, the, the highest concentration is here in New York. We have Nifty Gateway here. We have uh, Gemini. We have OpenSea. We have... Um, there are a ton of the Brooklyn artists, uh, that are, they're really experimental and in the Coda's art, uh, genre. And I think like, this is a great place to come and get centered, grounded network. So basically mm -hmm. the New York community is so dialed in to international communities. Um, and also you're in this like VC land, right. Of people that want to invest in you, not necessarily do you need VC money, but, it's just, like even VCs have a lot of knowledge about startups and things that, you know, can go right and wrong. So the community here is just very friendly. It's concentrated um, just in the manner, the, the fact that Manhattan is super concentrated and it's very welcoming. So uh, also women here, uh, the women community is I love like the boys club, which is happening. And I know you've probably done some podcasts recently with the boys club, but I love the edge of it. It's not about like being a woman. In it's not like the women's club. It's, it's just like the super edgy, like we're getting together. We're going to trade some assets and like guys are, can come to you, but it's a friendly space for women that are um, very entrepreneurial. And I, I don't know if you get that anywhere else. Um, so I'm really excited about this space in New York in general and also NFT NYC this has been an ongoing development for a while. I am personally moving to Denver, but that's mm -hmm. for different reasons. And also the engineering space over in, in Denver is really great. But um, as far as like launching a startup, connecting with content creators, people that want to actually build the metaverse, this is, this is the hub. Um, contenders would be London for gaming, uh, for blockchain gaming. There's, you know, there's a quite a few people out there. Um, LA, if you're a content creator, you just want to be more social, or if you're into that sort of party DJ culture, which is still viable, even if it's not like, you know, building games. Um, so yeah, I would say those are the hubs and, but New York is the serious, the serious grind and people here are not going to waste your time. You're going to get connected. You're going to contribute. And you know, this is, so this, that was my pitch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've in in my head I've kind of uh, categorized you as uh, uh, one of the crypto socialites because uh, I, I saw you at all the conferences and you were you were being a crypto socialite before even I got out of my apartment during COVID. Uh, but I wonder if if that if you were if you would consider yourself a crypto socialite before even crypto is what it was like today. Like what about 2017, 2018? What was if 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 there was one, what was like social in real life, social life, like back, back before COVID back before like crypto is what it was today. Cause like the generation of 2020 to 2021 crypto is very, very different than the 2017, 2018 crypto. I'm just wondering about like your, the history of crypto socialization. Cause I really only got into it in the 2020s. Yeah, no. So actually it, it wasn't like that. Um, I actually was terribly afraid of even doing podcasts, public speaking. I just wanted to hide in the background and like make my art and like put it out there and let people experience it. And I didn't, like I told you, I was anonymous basically until 2016, 2017. I wasn't wanting to be an individual in the space. I wanted to just participate. Um, and then I would say like in 2017, I started public speaking more. Um, what was I going to say? I forgot. I forgot what it was going to tell you, but like, no, the, the scene. Sh what was socialization like back then versus how it is now? I mean, the part, it wasn't about the parties, right? It was actually about the technology. So uh, you'd go to events in 2016, 2017, you were learning about the tech and I was seeing artists and what they were doing. The party, the party culture really didn't pick up until maybe that first really great bull run in 2018 with that big consensus conference in New York. Mm -hmm. Um, and like I was on a yacht, Anthony DiOrio's yacht. He had like helped launch the Ethereum ICO and he had this huge mm -hmm. like yacht party and that's kind of where it would like shifted. But then you had this massive bear market that happened and, yeah. and, um, and then it, the party culture came back with the NFTs, but 
it's like, it's, I, you still have like, for example, Eat Denver it was still a really cool experience in the fact that it's so concentrated with developers, um, which is why it's one of the most popular conferences. So if you kind of look at that, the fact that people are really hungry to go and participate in the, in the developer conferences versus like Bitcoin Miami, which is coming up. Um, and it's mm. exhausting. Like, I don't want to go to those things anymore. They're, they they <laughs> clear me out. And so like, no, I'm not, I'm really not a socialite. Like I just like, I was trying to figure out and connect with all the people um, to, but it's, it's not the path. Like I, if you were to sit back and be like, did I enter and make these choices because I wanted to go party all the time? Or did I like want to go and make something really cool? Um, you know, I think we're just a little lost right now in that conversation because everyone's just really excited and that excitement just translates to parties. Yeah. Um, one thing I always, uh, I always notice about you when I see you in real life is you, you always have the most, um, Maybe vibrant is the right word. Expressive is definitely the right word. Expressive outfit on. Uh, your fashion sense is like killer. <laughs> and so it's, it's funny to hear you say that like you were kind of shy in, in 2017, 2018, because I don't get any of that from you now. Uh, and it, it's it's just funny to watch like because you because you kind of like you, you like straight up sparkle in your outfit when you walk around whatever conference we're at, wherever party we're at. Can you kind of go into just uh, just a little bit of that? Just like how you decide to like curate an outfit? Yeah. Uh, well, so in the same way that like I think the technology should surprise and delight, I think it's always fun to lean into the fact that, you know, you can play as a character, you can have, um, bring a little extra sparkle in a way that surprises people. And I like to do that because it it breaks this like expectation of, different stereotypes. Um, so there's times where I even like wear a cape. And we saw this in Eat Denver too, people like teams of people wearing capes around. And it's mm -hmm. kind of like this, let's let's be a little different. Let's think outside the 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 mo this um what what people would be expecting. And like for example, I have like these glitter sparkle boots and they always light people up when I wear them. Um, and I think that's the kind of thing that people want with their applications and their experiences in general in this space as well. So honestly, at, at ETH Denver, um, I, so I have, I have little boys and I was, I was allowed to bring them in to the VIP and we were all told to wait there for just a little bit. And then the ETH Denver organizer walked in and he's like, I have a surprise for you, just one second. And so then comes in the buffer corn, right? Mm -hmm. And the buffer corn is there. And my little boys are playing with them. And for, for listeners that don't know, Buffy the Buffacorn is the uh, unicorn buffalo mascot of East Denver. So think of just like a guy in like a uh, football mascot uniform. Right. So the, and then the little boys are playing with him. And then I turn around to get like a glass of water for someone. And I turn back and he's taken off the head of his costume. And it's Vitalik. And it's Vitalik <laughs> there in the buff court. So I can say that I'm not the only person that like wants to surprise and delight both with technology and also just in your in real life persona and who you are and the joy you're bringing to the world. Like, I think it's just a narrative about, and also it's like, it's really good to, to remind yourself that we're doing this for each other. It's a collaborative. Um, what are you bringing to the table? How are you contributing? And I think that, that just, that story is more than just walking to a party with a VAP pass and being cool. Right. There's a difference mm -hmm. between doing that and what we have today and then what we want for the future. And I so I think like so, yeah, that's probably a lot of what I do. What I do is because I think the surprising delight just carries over. Uh, one of the lines from our Chris Dixon podcast that stuck with me is uh, Web3 has made the Internet weird again which was like a big relief to, to Chris because Web 2 just felt so stale to him. But Web 3 is like weird and weird stuff's happening. When you tell me like people are wearing capes at East Denver, teams are wearing capes at East Denver and you like to like dress as, a, as like an avatar of sorts and kind of like stand out in a way that you kind of want your internet avatar to stand out. It kind of feels like we're trying to bring the metaverse into the real life. Like we're trying to make the, the physical world a little bit more like the digital world while we're also trying to make the digital world a little bit more like the real world. Um, see, that seems to be a little bit of what's going on. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's going to be more, like, I want more playful. How do you play, like, inspire people mm -hmm. to play? And absolutely. I think that's something I'm actually really focused on right now is um, how do we fix some of these in real life problems in a way where we're so disconnected by the work we're doing online 
in a way where we're not taking away from our real life experiences, but where the technology becomes complementary to it. So yeah, I think those are all the next big questions to solve. All right, Marguerite, the last uh, line of, of topic that I want to, to go on involves uh, a sort of a pseudo Rorschach test. Uh, so I'm just going to say one word and I just want to see what comes out of your brain after I say okay. it. Um, curation. Ooh. Uh, is the aesthetic law. Is the aesthetic law. Okay, now can you unpack that for me? <laughs> I say this because I'm just bringing on in a blockade games the lead cyberpunk curator. And in his descriptions, I labeled him as aesthetic law of kind of the quality control of the company. Um, mm. And in that, like, if it's, we're not hitting his curate, like curation, like ex acceptability meter, then it's not good enough. And as a company, we're failing, we're below bar. So like aesthetic law, meaning this is what's acceptable and mm. we should be striving above. So in, um, in other curated experiences, I like, I'm sure this, this is the same thing as aesthetic law. Like, are you, are you going to make the cut for whatever this criteria is? Um, so yeah, for, for us internally, we've brought in someone that's an expert in cyberpunk, uh, cyberpunk curation. Mm. How about, um, inside of the context of just like your friends, your loved ones, the experiences that you want both in the metaverse and outside in the real world, how does the, how does the, how does the importance of curation impact these things? Um, so I think curation is a form of art, right? Like, I. Uh, you are, it doesn't necessarily have to be exclusive, but in this context, you're thinking of a flow of an experience. You're like how one thing relates to another and how aesthetically all together, it's this cohesive um, space or level that f resonates. And I think curation has a, a place. So like, in regards to like, what was the question with my friends and, and other people? I, I mean, you can allow yourself to feel left out by not being included in a story, particular storytelling version of a curation, curated experience. But honestly, the curator's job is just to pull the things together that they think all belong together and to tell this like experience or offer an experience or tell a story um, in the best way possible. And that's usually by like threading connections across the mediums. And how, how do you do that in your life? Is that a fair, fair, is that too open-ended of a question? How do I do that in my life? Uh, yeah. what, what experiences do you try and curate for yourself and what kind of experiences do you try and curate for others? Yeah. Um, I guess like, uh, even just with, so I am a queen of making playlists. Mm. So, uh, I may, I love making playlists and I curate them and I think about the flow and I like get rid of songs. I'm like, I don't like that song there. And then, and then I like to share them with people that I think like would experience them in ways that I like, you know, like I, so in curation in my life, like that's something I think about. I also think about quality control of my friends. I think about people around me. I think about, um, projects I involve myself in, um, who am I advising, mm. um, yeah, there's a lot of curation as far as, you know, curation is just another word for filtering and filtering to, for what lens um, and what sort of desired outcome. So, yeah, it's just like, so, yeah. Marguerite, what makes you optimistic about the future? Am I optimistic about the future? Just to think about that. Like how you like just said I was oh, optimistic no. about the future. Are you not? <laughs> like, you just I just kind of assume everyone in crypto <laughs> is. Um, what makes me optimistic is the fact that I honestly think we're going to be able to create tools to allow people to be creative um, in environments in which maybe they otherwise would have not had these opportunities. I think that I think if we look at the inclusive nature of if you've ever been to an Eat Denver event, if you've ever been to one of these Web3 events, you'll see that there's just really like, let, how can I help you? How can I empower you? 
sort of ethos that exists. And I think that's going to extend and spill over to a lot of what we're building. Um, I think it does already do that. And I think as we do that heavy lifting for people, we're going to just create a better future because the more voices at the table, the more talent, the more skills, the more empowered and educated people, the like the better problem solvers you have in the room. And the more people that are going to say no to stuff that they don't like or things that are against that positive outcome. So I think like that shift and um, becoming, having autonomy is going to be huge because once you plant that seed, you can't take it away. Like people will not forget what it feels like to have, like to be autonomous. Is there any bit of advice that you followed that has been immensely useful to you that you think is worth sharing to listeners? That is a good question. Um, I guess something that I've thought if you were shy, like I was really, really shy. Um, and you feel like inferior, like you don't have anything to contribute to, you know, the best thing you can do is, especially if you have a skill set, like being an artist, it's really hard to get a traditional job in that capacity, finding ways to contribute and building up your reputation Um, How can you support others? How can you bring value is a great way to get started with that reputation based uh, background, which will allow you to have this foundation to build this individuality on top of it doesn't need to start all at once. Um, It can be slow over time, but just being a contributor actually is what has unlocked for me some of the best opportunities and also when you contribute in a way where you showed up and you did something magical and people remember and then they give you better opportunities so looking for those opportunities where there's space for you where you can contribute where you can win and allowing that reputation to build to lead and design your own career it can seem scary but honestly it's it's so much more freeing than I think trying to work underneath like a corporate structure where things are way more restrictive in this sort of economy that we have and space that we have, it's like the more you show up and the more you deliver and the more you prove yourself, the more doors that open just left and right. And you get to choose like which one is best for you. Whereas you don't really get that in the like traditional corporate structure. So I mean, maybe to some extent, but I've really enjoyed that as a creative. And it's like the minute you trust yourself is when you really start to unlock your potential and stop living out of fear. Um, so and what's surprising is I've been in this space so so far, so long that I take that for granted. There, I see a lot of talented people really struggle with that and struggle with that fear and like the doubt and belief in themselves that they can actually catch themselves and they can find ways to create value. So look at people that are successful, people that are doing things that you're attracted to, show up, contribute, and like take a leap. Marguerite, thank you for joining me on Layer Zero. Thank you, David. Cheers. Hey, we hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, head over to Bankless HQ right now to develop your crypto investing skills and learn how to free yourself from banks and gain your financial independence. We recommend joining our daily newsletter, podcast, and community as a Bankless Premium subscriber to get the most out of your Bankless experience. You'll get access to our market analysis, our alpha leaks, and exclusive content, and even the Bankless token for airdrops, raffles, and unlocks. If you're interested in crypto, the Bankless community is where you want to be. Click the link in the description to become a Bankless Premium subscriber today. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel for in-depth interviews with industry leaders, Ask Me Anythings, and weekly roll-ups where we summarize the week in crypto and other fantastic content. Thanks everyone for watching and being on the journey as we build out the Bankless Nation.